Oh, Adelaide. What a tremendous place to have an accident. Whether you're in a V8 supercar, an F1 car, or even a Ute. Whether you're fighting for the World Championship, or taking a Sunday drive. Adelaide has always been a perfect place to smash up a race car. Welcome to the last ever Adelaide Grand Prix, courtesy of Formula One 1995. Hello everyone, and welcome to Random F1 Race Reviews. I'm afraid, after that intro, I do have to start on a relatively serious note. During qualifying for the 1995 Australian Grand Prix, Mika Hakkinen had a horrific shunt. Next year, and there, Mika Hakkinen, that looks unpleasant, there's a big, big shunt, Mika Hakkinen has gone sideways heavily into the there's, 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 oh look at that, well we don't know why, that just the car came so quickly into sight. After finishing second at the previous Grand Prix, Hakkinen came to Australia with a real chance of scoring his first win, but instead he crashed heavily and very nearly lost his life. Only quick action by the medical personnel saved him from certain death, and even so, many drivers were reportedly told that he had passed away. The mid-1990s were a tough time for Formula One, with the fatal crashes of Senna and Ratzenberger, surrounded by the further serious crashes suffered by Hakkinen, Wendlinger, Leto, Montermany, Lamy, and more. It threatened to bring an end to Formula One altogether, and if Hakkinen had died, then the effects would have been felt in motor racing forever. After all, we would never have got to see those two terrific championship winning years in 1998 and 1999, nor would we have seen any of Mika's 20 terrific wins. Heck, we wouldn't have even got that 2007 song Grace Kelly. Oh, wrong Mika? Uh, okay then. Well, hopefully that's lightened the mood enough to say, let's go racing in Adelaide. It was a Williams 1-2 on the starting grid, with Hill ahead of Cool third, and world champion elect Schumacher was in third place. Since this was the last race of the season, a bunch of drivers were making their final starts in F1, whether they knew it or not, and the first of those was Mark Blundell in 10th place. Carl Wendlinger was another of those in 18th, as was the legendary Taki Inui in 19th, Bertrand Gascho in 23rd, and the entire Pacific team. As the cars got underway for the formation lap, Luca Badoa didn't, and he was forced to withdraw at the very last minute since his car couldn't be restarted. Don't worry Luca, next year you get to drive the incredible 40 Corsa car, that'll be so much better. As the race began for real, it looked as if Hill had the advantage, but watch as Coulthard sweeps through to lead on the outside of Turn 1. The championship was already over, and so with it went team orders. Schumacher got a bad start from third, and so the two Ferraris passed him, as everyone got through just about cleanly behind. Making the best of a bad job, Schumacher repassed the Lacey at the end of the lap. Interestingly, those two would swap cars for the start of 96. I mentioned the Pacific team previously, and sadly the race only lasted two laps for Andrea Montermany, whose gearbox developed a Monterminal issue and forced him into a spin. This will be the first incident of many, trust me. Gerhard Berger, who became the most experienced active F1 driver after the retirement of Nigel Mansell, was doing an excellent job holding up Schumacher in third place, but with the speed of the Benetton, it was only going to be a matter of time before the places swapped. Now the question was whether Michael would be able to get after the Williams drivers. Skrrr. And off spins the other Pacific! Gasho nearly has a crash -o. Luckily, he was able to keep it going, unlike his teammate. Now, if you were watching Shumi and wondering where the other Benetton is in this race, we're on board with it now, as Johnny Herbert follows 6th place Heinz Harold Frentzen. The 1995 Benetton was a very tricky car to drive, because it was set up to be extremely twitchy, as per Schumacher's liking, and this allowed Shumi to win the championship at the expense of the other driver in the team, much like what we're seeing in 2021 with both Red Bull and Mercedes. There are quite a few parallels between the mid-90s and nowadays, actually, but that's a topic for a few video. And if you're wondering where the other Sauber is, unfortunately he's out, and for good at that. Carl Wendlinger had never quite been the same after his serious crash at Monaco in 1994, and even though he returned to F1 in 95, he struggled badly. 
To make matters worse, in practice for this Grand Prix, he had this nasty shunt in which he damaged his thumb, and he had to retire from the race after just 8 laps due to the pain. This ended his F1 career. Luckily, he actually had a relatively successful career after Formula 1, getting class wins at Le Mans in 99 and 2000, and winning the FIA GT Championship in 99 with Olivier Beretta. Yeet. Anyway, whoa, Nelly! Oh, what you just saw was Taki Anui ending his Formula 1 career in the most Anui of ways, with a high-speed spin into the wall. Honestly, it's a shame to see him go. Obviously, Taki had a certain reputation, which is why I now give the Anui trophy to the worst driver, but it's a reputation Taki himself often plays up to, dubbing himself the worst driver in Formula 1. I'm afraid this incident here lent that claim a lot of credence. He was totally out of control. How a man who couldn't even score a point in F3000 landed an F1 seat is a mystery to me. Suddenly, the cameras cut to 6th place to find it being contested between Frentzen and Herbert, with the latter missing his braking and embarrassingly being right passed by not only Frentzen, but a lapped 40 as well. Better luck next time, Johnny. Now, it's that time of the race, so we have to talk strategy. Two stops were expected for all of the top runners, although Benetton expected to run longer than Williams, so all eyes were on the leaders as Hill stopped first. His pit stop went by without a hitch, so all focus shifted to Coulthard. When David came in, I don't think I need to tell you what happened. He misjudged the entry and crashed into the pit wall. This was undoubtedly the most famous and embarrassing mistake of Coulthard's entire career, and it represented an easy win thrown away. The young Scotsman had only won once before in Formula 1, and he would never get another chance to tame Adelaide. What a way to blow it! This put Schumacher temporarily into the lead, although Damon Hill suddenly had the advantage. In Coulthard's defence, it was quite slippery in the pit lane that day, as demonstrated here by Roberto Moreno. And the accidents came thick and fast, that's Rubens Barrichello often into the tyres. When Schumacher made his stop, it became clear that the team had misjudged his strategy, as he had a very close call with Jean Lacy going through to take effective second place. With his teammate out and his two closest rivals battling, it was suddenly looking excellent for Damon Hill, who by this stage was about 8 seconds up the road. Now here we are later on in the lap, and they've collided! Alacy simply turned in on Schumacher, and they both have damage! Bang! A front spoiler flew off Alacy's Ferrari, and he pitted! Now the order was Hill first, Schumacher second, and Berger third. Off spins Pedro Lamy now, after locking up the front brakes and panicking. Interestingly, he spun again while attempting to get the car pointed in the right direction, leading to one of the all-time classic Murray Walker remarks. Well, he's making a real bright porridge of this, a Portuguese porridge. Valtteri Bottas approves. Now, you may have noticed that that's Schumacher in the pits, attempting to assess the damage caused by the Alacy incident and replace a possible slow puncture. Alacy then returned to the pits himself and retired from the race for good, getting his comeuppance for the collision. And Schumacher was out too! This means that Herbert was now second but yet to stop, with Berger third and primed to take second. This also ended Schumacher's time at Benetton, as he would move to Ferrari for 1996, starting the most storied 11 years of any racing driver's career. Talking of Herbert, here he comes into the pits. Or not, as he almost becomes the third victim of the pit wall! Nicely bailed out there. Nowadays, that would earn you a penalty or a reprimand, but it's better than ending up in the wall any day. This did mean that Frentzen was all the more likely to take third place, though, after Herbert's actual stop. That's more like it. On lap 35, Gerhard Berger dropped out as well! The leaders are dropping like flies in this race! Now the order was Hill, Frentzen, Herbert, with a real chance of points emerging for smaller teams. Everything was to play for, with half of the cars already out of the race. With Frentzen and Herbert battling for second, Mark Blundell demonstrated some really bad backmarking, getting right in the way of both of them. Look, Mark, I think you're amazing, and not only because you gave me a signed visor that you race with at Le Mans, but please get out of the way. Lurky held them up for an entire lap! Whoa! Good pass, Heinz Harold, as you flip the bird and lock up at the same time. Johnny follows him through. 
two seconds ahead. That's a replay of a re oh, ho, 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 ho. that is not very polite, Heinz Harold. By this point, Damon Hill had such a lead that Williams were able to commit to a three-stop strategy, which they've been flexible to since the start. Here's his second stop of the day, once again going down without a hitch. Not without hitch was Frentzen, who became yet another retirement in very similar circumstances to Berger. This put Eddie Irvine up into third place. How many more twists does this race want to throw? And how many are going to be through dodgy backmarking? Oh dear, Mark. Oh my goodness, a pit stop disaster would be all we need. Look how long Hill's been in the pits for. His tyre's still going on, it's his front left that's the problem. And it's a 22 second stop in all. Well, he got away with it because he had so much for lead it didn't matter, but that's a bit of a scare. Wait, are you serious? Another podium runner is out? What bitter luck for Eddie Irvine. Honestly, what is going on? Olivier Pan is stopped a third for Ligier. And a fire, and it's Johnny Herbert, and I'm not even going to pretend to be surprised anymore. That gives third in the championship to Coulthard, but who does it give third in the race to? Hmm, let's see. Checks notes. What the? Gianni Morbidelli? Where in the footwork heart did he come from? Yes, there's only nine cars remaining, but even so, he's ahead of a McLaren and a Tyrrell in a flipping footwork, a team that haven't scored a podium since they were Arrows in 1989. Let's see if he can survive the podium runner curse today, wow. So, here's Olivier Parnis, now second from 12th on the grid, making a splash and dash pit stop 10 laps from the end. He had more than enough time in hand to get out still second, but the team started to feel that something was up. The engine was overheating and he was beginning to struggle. Would the podium curse strike again? Well, I guess we'll find out in due course, but in the meantime, out went Ukio Katayama. Only eight cars remained in an absolutely crazy Grand Prix. Oh, it really is threatening to become seven. Look at that smoke now coming out from behind Parnas' car. He's continuing on at this point, but how much longer will that car hold out? Morbidelli is suddenly gaining on him, but even that won't matter if Parnas' engine expires in the next four laps. I love the way that rear wing still proudly displays, powered by Mugen Honda, as if it's powered by anything other than willpower right now. He's staying out, look! Ligier do not want to give up now, who needs an engine anyway? What you're seeing here is Hill passing Parnas to lead by an incredible two laps. It may be a massive lead, but it's actually a blessing in disguise for Parnas because there's no way his car can do the distance smoking like that. He just wants to finish this race, he doesn't care about the win anymore. And that's a good thing too, because there you see Damon Hill winning by a stunning two laps. That's only happened twice in the history of the sport, and will probably never happen again. Parnas somehow managed to finish second with his engine smoking like a man from the 50s, and Gianni Morbidelli took his first and only podium in third. Fourth was Mark Blundell, somehow finishing behind a footwork despite driving of McLaren. Fifth was Mika Salo, and sixth was Pedro Lamy, who scored his only ever point and Minardi's only point of the year, despite making an absolute porridge of it. Eight cars finished in total, capping off a crazy end to the Adelaide circuit's time in Formula 1. I gave the Grand Prix an 8 out of 10 overall, mainly for its insane unpredictability and attrition. The two bonus points came because I feel the score would otherwise have been let down by the race's lack of championship implications, what with both titles having already been decided, and because I felt that it was a fitting way to end Adelaide's time in Formula 1. The track has of course been in the news recently, with moves from the local government effectively ending racing there, before subsequently saving it from demolition, so its existence appears to be hanging in the balance. Let's hope it's preserved and forever gets recognition as the legendary straight track it is. Now, I had a little bit of trouble deciding who should be driver of the day, since there were so many drivers who deserved it. I wondered, should it go to Damon Hill for his grand slam of pole, fastest lap and victory by two laps, or was it too simple once all his competitors dropped out? Should it go to Olivier Parnas for his ability to drag a smoking wreck across the line in second, or was the fact that he finished two laps down too much for detractor? Should it go to Gianni Morbidelli for his fantastic podium finish, or would we all have paid no attention to his performance if it hadn't been for all the aggression? I honestly didn't know, so I decided to decide it in the fairest way possible. It's Hill. 
I gave the Anui trophy for worst driver to Taki Anui, because let's face it, it had to be. Drive safely guys, and I'll see you in the next one.